Welcome to Political Beatdown. I'm Ben Micellis, joined by Michael Cohen. Wow, we have a lot to discuss. Week one of the Trump criminal trial in Manhattan. A lot of developments recently. Today, Trump was admonished for intimidating a prospective juror. Donald Trump got the nickname Sleepy Don or Don Snorleone because he keeps on uh, allegedly falling asleep in the uh, courtroom. Uh, six jurors have now been selected, a four person as well as part of those six jurors have been selected from the first batch of 96 uh, jurors. Donald Trump's motions yesterday to try to recuse Justice Mershon and keep out other evidence was denied. We've been doing this handy scorecard here at the Midas Touch Network to give everybody the updates from Trump trial day one, Trump trial day two. Salty, if we have it, do we have Trump trial day one summary first that we can maybe put up. Let me just go down this super quick. And then, of course, I know you all want to hear from Michael Cohen, who, of course, uh, will be a witness uh, in this case. There may be some limitations in what he can and can't talk about, and I'm sure we'll all respect that. But Trump trial day one, Trump's motion to recuse Justice Mershon was denied. Evidence of Trump catch and kill will be allowed. Uh, Trump's subpoena to the Department of Justice actually turned up documents from Steve Bannon, Kellyanne Conway, and Hope Hicks uh, regarding communications around the release of the Access Hollywood tape. The Manhattan District Attorney filed a motion to hold Donald Trump in contempt. The judge expedited the contempt hearing to April 23rd. Donald Trump fell asleep. The judge ordered Donald Trump to submit his defense exhibits in 24 hours. The jurors arrived. Trump fell asleep again. 50 of the 96 jurors said they could not be fair. That was day one. Let's go to day two. We pull up the day two scorecard. Trump arrived. He blamed his accountant and lawyers for the fraud he committed. Trump waived his right to be there at the sidebar, which he didn't waive on day one. The voir dire process resumed. Trump fell asleep again. Trump scowled at a juror and was admonished by Justice Mershon. There was more voir dire, and then the first six jurors were just sworn in. I'm a visual learner, Michael Cohen, so these scorecards help me kind of keep up with everything. Of course, everybody wants to hear your reaction to day one and day two. So let me turn it over to you, Mr. Cohen. Well, let me just ask you where it is, Ben, that you came up with that incredibly smart, funny um, name of Don Snorleone. Salty, take it away. <laughs> That's Don uh, you know, Snorleone. Like right Donald there. Snorleone. There you go. Right? Sleepy Donald. Oh, you know, man. there's you know, it's uh, very there's funny. I was watching I was watching Rachel Maddow last night. Uh, <laughs> and she turned around and she goes, The one thing that you have to do, if you're gonna constantly attack, say Joe Biden and calling him sleepy Joe Biden, is just keep your eyes open. As long as you can keep your eyes open, you can <laughs> say whatever. If you want, look. Let me let me say this, right? Because you um, you're you're correct. There's there's not a lot that I can or really should be saying. Yeah, you know, I I'm not in the courtroom. Uh, people like um, uh, you know, Agnifilo and Maggie Haberman, and you have uh, let's say Adam Reese. I think is in the uh, courtroom plus a whole bunch of other journalists and you know they're all there they're there firsthand they see what's actually going on uh for me again because i am going to be a witness in this i'm really trying to believe it or not even stay away from the news the only reason that i watched uh yesterday um rachel maddow's show is because the first 30 minutes of the show was dedicated to me. And it was dedicated to everything that I've been talking about for like the last five, six years about the way Donald Trump weaponized the Department of Justice to go against his critics. Which of course, is a far cry from you know, the allegations that he constantly raises that the Biden administration has weaponized the Justice Department to go after him. It is one of the most brilliant segments I have 
ever seen. She nails every aspect. She goes into things like with Jeffrey Berman, how exactly like my book Revenge, but she goes into Jeffrey Berman and how he went ahead and he um, was being contacted by Maine Justice and that they wanted to, um, after I had already played, they wanted to have the charges dropped because they named Donald into him. I want to say this one thing, and I've said this all along, so I feel very comfortable in saying this to our brigaders. This case, which so many people had sort of ignored and that they sort of shit on, oh, it's the least offensive of the four cases of the um of the four cases. And so I've never turned around and said that this type of a case, even though the way it's being described now as more than just campaign finance violation, that this is uh, really an injustice to the American people regarding the 2020 election and 2016 election and them knowing exactly who and what they were voting for. This is certainly not as grotesque an abuse of the law as the January 6th insurrection or the the taking of these top secret documents, showing them to people, refusing to return them, or the attempt to overturn a free and fair election, the Fonnie Willis case. This one is not as far back in the Kentucky Derby version that I like to constantly call it of handicapping cases. It appears that this may also be the one case that ultimately goes to trial and gets a resolution prior to the 2024 election. So this this is a this is a very unusual case and Donald is very nervous right now. You could see it in his face, you could see the way he walks, you could see the way he's slurring his speech. You can see everything about him right now is he's he's exasperated, he's angry. And nothing that he's doing is going to help his cause. That's that's where I kind of want to stay with a response to your question. Well, let me try to poke and prod just a little bit. Otherwise, I won't be doing my job. And I think I know the areas where I can poke and prod appropriately. Um, Don Snorleone, Donald Trump falling asleep the way he is in court. It's um, been described as fairly jarring to the reporters that like, He'll be there and then all of a sudden, like, he'll fall asleep, not just for a few seconds, but for like minutes. This was today. Frank Runyon reports Trump's head slowly dropped, his eyes closed, it jerked back upward. He adjusts himself, then his head droops again. He straightens up, leaning back, his head dupes for a third time. He shakes his shoulders, eyes closed still, his head drops. Finally, he pops his eyes open. And, you know, one of the reasons that I think we know that Donald Trump is actually um, trying to put out some other narrative that this is not, you know, I see some people saying, oh, Donald Trump's trying to do this on purpose. And this is what he's doing. I really don't think so right there. I mean, Trump was putting out some messages uh, on emails yesterday saying uh, emergency broadcast from President Trump. I'm addressing the nation. I'm addressing the nation. I just stormed out of Biden's kangaroo court. And he's obviously trying to create this narrative that he was not sleepy. Um, His lawyer, Alina Haba, went on the right wing media and talked about, I don't think he was falling asleep. I don't think that was um, happening. But just, Cohen, what do you make of that aspect? Because that's not really getting into it. You've known Donald Trump for a long time. Was he one to just kind of fall asleep in in meetings? Does this surprise you? What do you make of it? Like I said, when I saw him walk through the door, you could, first of all, you see that weird sort of angle that he walks with his body sort of tipping forward. Um, You could see it in his face that he's definitely not sleeping. He looks absolutely exhausted. And let me let me just give you a little personality thing as it relates to Donald. When he's angry, you see it in his face. Um, he would not be a good poker player because his ticks and his tells are just written right on his sleeve. He's really freaking angry right now. He never thought that he would ever be sitting again in a defendant's chair. This time now, 
It's not about the money. That, of course, is a real problem for him. But we're now talking about his freedom. We're talking about a criminal conviction. And he is furious. He thought that his lawyers would be able to escape um, that he'd be able to escape accountability, that his lawyers would be able to, like the three other cases, somehow manage to push them off indefinitely, uh, and that he could be out there right now, whether he would be campaigning or not, whether he'd be on the golf course or not, whatever it would be. He right now is furious that he has to be in New York, that he has to be in the courtroom, that Judge Mershon is a no-nonsense guy, that every single time that he goes ahead and he does things, there's a repercussion for it, including, including the ongoing and continuous attacks despite the gag order on Stormy Daniels, on myself, on the judge's daughter, on everybody. You know, next week they're having a hearing regarding the gag order. And Here's the thing. He knows the dog whistle, Ben, that he's blowing. He knows the trouble that he's creating. Um, he knows exactly what he's doing, and that's why he does it. He knows He knows that there's a, there's a group of his acolytes, of his supporters, that are triggered by anything he says. So when he starts going after people, myself included, you can't imagine the amount of hate that comes at a person and he knows it which as far as i'm concerned is a form of witness intimidation and obstruction of justice and i do really hope that the judge actually not just admonishes him but really holds him to you know holds his ass to the fire because the last thing that we really that i really want is i don't want to see anybody get hurt especially myself and what he's doing right now is a call to that. So I would say that I successfully poked and prodded on that one because I think I know where I need to stay away from and the types of things that I, I could be asking here. Donald Trump's, if you, if you think about the New York Attorney General civil fraud case, Donald Trump stuck to this one line that Justice Engeron valued Mar-a-Lago at $18 million. Could you believe it? It's valued at 50 to 100 times that this judge is going to say that Mar-a-Lago is 18 million. Of course, that's not what Justice Ngoron said. Justice Ngoron was using Donald Trump's numbers. Trump devalued the property from around $400, $500 million to $18 million so Trump could pay less taxes. And Goran didn't do an appraisal, and Goran used Donald Trump's numbers. But I mentioned that because that's what Trump was saying. He he stuck to that line every press conference, right? Mar-a-Lago, Mar-a-Lago, sure. Mar-a-Lago. Now, what's the new one that Donald Trump's been rolling out? That he really wanted to attend Barron's high school graduation on May 17th, and that Justice Mershon is preventing him from being at Barron's high school graduation. And Donald Trump writes, what am I supposed to tell Barron right now that this judge is not letting me go to the graduation? And again, that's false. Uh, Justice Mershon did not make any ruling one way or the other. Justice Mershon said, it's mid-April. I don't know if we're even going to have court on that date. So I'm not making a ruling right now. You're a criminal defendant. You need to show up. But let me just show you what I mean when Donald Trump, I mean, he posts this all the time now on Trump media. He has Alina Haba go and do the right-wing media and say, but he wanted to be at Barron's graduation. Let me just show you this from the press conference that Donald Trump gave at the end of court yesterday. Let's play this clip. So thank you very much. Uh, we had some amazing things happen today. As you know, my son is graduating from high school, and it looks like the judge will not let me go to the graduation of my son, who's worked very, very hard. Uh, he's a great student. He's very proud of the fact that he did so well. I was looking forward for years to have graduation with his mother and father there. And it looks like the judges are going to allow me to escape this scam. It's a scam trial. And so let me just share this with you. This is from Jeff Perlman's research. Good reporter says in 1996, Donald Trump Jr., Graduated from the Hill School in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, Donald Trump failed to attend graduation. 
In 2000, Ivanka Trump graduated from Coat, a boarding school in Wellingford, Connecticut. Donald Trump failed to attend graduation. In 2002, Eric Trump graduated from the Hill School in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Donald Trump failed to attend graduation. In 2012, Tiffany Trump graduated from Viewpoint School in Calabasas, California. Donald Trump failed to attend graduation. And then in 2024, Barron Trump is graduating from Oxbridge Academy in Palm Beach. Thanks to legal proceedings, Donald Trump can pretend he had plans on attending. Not really here, Cohen, talking so much about the stuff that you probably can't say as in the case, but from your knowledge and observation of Trump, him saying that he really wanted to. Well, I was going to say that. that. I was going to interrupt you before and turn around and say I wasn't aware that he went to any of the kids' um, graduations, not to mention, you know, when it related to school here in Manhattan. This, of course, was prior, way prior to Trump uh, even deciding to run. Uh, it was Melania and I that put Barron into school here, private school in Manhattan, when ultimately uh, it was agreed that Melania and Barron were going to move to DC uh, and so on. It was Melania and I that went and got him into school uh, in Potomac in, D in DC. Uh, I find it not just comical, right? But I find it, um, I, I, I find it insulting that that's the big issue. You know, I missed my 25th birthday, my 25th anniversary and my wife's 50th birthday because I was in Otisville in part because of things that I had done at the direction of and for the benefit of Donald Trump. So before I start shedding a tear for him, for Barron, and I'm sure Melania is extremely excited he's not going to be there um rest assured you know i i'm not i'm not losing i'm not losing any sleep nor am i going to shed a tear that trump can't go to baron's graduation cohen finally if i can poke and prod not necessarily about any of the the facts that you know you may not be able to discuss right now but a lot of the people in the chat right now want to know how are you handling things? How are you feeling? Um, I, I, it, to the extent you're able to share, um, you know, look, this contempt hearing against Donald Trump is about his threats against you, among in other part. people. So, you know, obviously, you know, obviously, you know, he, he, this must be weighing heavily on you, but I don't want to assume or infer. So how are you feeling? Um, <laughs> had a little uh, blood pressure issue the other day. You know, I, I was on uh, Sunday. I was on the weekend with Michael Steele and Alicia Menendez and Simone and uh, Sanders. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, um, it it was it was a fabulous um, two segments on the show. And I turn around and I had said, I don't want, I, I don't know why people don't seem to either want to acknowledge this. I don't want to, I don't want to be a witness in this case. I've said it a do, at, at least a dozen, if not two dozen times. I'm a subpoenaed non-party witness to this case. I didn't turn around and say, oh, 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 oh can I, can I, you know, can I testify? Can I testify? It's it's uncomfortable. You know that he's going after all the witnesses. Anybody who can cause him trouble, he's going to come at them again and again and again. And he does it again by blowing this dog whistle. So, you know, it's it's also not it's not uh, it's not relaxing to every time you turn on the television. There they are talking about you, uh, you know. This is, again, a case of first impression where the very first time in U.S. history, a former president is being criminally charged and can ultimately be found, can, I say, not will, I say can, ultimately be found guilty by a jury of his peers. Um, it's an embarrassment to our country. I would prefer... As I said again to the team over there at the weekend, that 
if they called me up tomorrow and said, hey, you know what? There's enough documents. There's enough corroborating testimony. We really don't need you. Thank you for, you know, for uh, agree, you know, for agreeing and accepting this subpoena, yada, yada. I'd be very, I'd be very okay with it. All right. Um, on top of that, a big concern that I have, something, Ben, that I've shared with not just you, but I've shared it with the brigaders, is that he will ultimately be the Republican nominee for the presidency of the United States. Now, while I believe that this is going to be a massive blue wave victory, you never know. And he has already come clean and said it's the one true thing that Donald has actually said to the press, said to the American people, has said to everybody that if, in fact, he wins, besides for rewriting the Constitution, besides for stripping the legislative and judicial branches of their power, besides for conferring all power onto himself, he intends to use SEAL Team 6 as his private brown shirt army. He's going to round up his um, critics and those who have harmed him, and he is going to try to do as much damage, inflict as much damage on them as possible, including something he constantly talks about, throw them all in Guantanamo Bay, throw them all in Gitmo, right, where they belong. This is not a joke because, look, you know, when it's a 50-50 race or it's a, you know, it's it's only two two political parties, there's still a chance. And I certainly know that Donald is not thrilled with me. This isn't the old days that I could uh, that I could promise you. Um, you know these ongoing constant threats. They you know they weigh heavy. They weigh heavy on you. So uh, it's it's not just him who's losing sleep. You know there's there there's a lot that goes into this, including not just to myself alone. I'm talking about to all the witnesses that are going to be there. Cohen, I know you probably won't be able to react to what I'm about to share, but for the purpose of our brigaders, I just want to keep them updated about all of today's developments. Um, This was Donald Trump arriving in court today where he was blaming his lawyers and accountants for marking this down as legal expenses, uh, the payments to Stormy Daniels. Let's play this clip. Thank you very much. This is a trial that should have never been brought. It's a trial that is being looked upon, looked at all over the world, they're calling. They're they're looking at it and analyzing it. Every legal pundit, every legal scholar said this trial is a disgrace. We have a Trump-hating judge. We have a judge who shouldn't be on this case. He's totally conflicted. But this is a trial that should never happen. It should have been thrown out a long time ago. If you look at uh, Jonathan Turley, Andy McCarthy, all great legal scholars, there's not one that we've been able to find that said this should be a trial. I called a, I was, I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense, some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you get indicted over that? I should be right now in Pennsylvania, in Florida, in many other states, North Carolina, Georgia, campaigning. This is all coming from the Biden White House because the guy can't put two sentences together. He can't. And then he had Alina Haba go on right wing media and compare Donald Trump. You want to say something? I really have to jump in and say something over here. First of all, when Jonathan Turley is a Trump ass kissing fool, he's a law professor over that I am constantly fighting with on my Twitter. He's anything that he can do to suck up to Donald, he does. Do I think he's a legal expert? Absolutely not. All right. And I like the I, I like the fact how Donald says things, which is every single legal scholar. You know what, Ben? You're a legal scholar. You're a legal scholar to the same extent Jonathan Turley is. Do you think that there's a real case here? You know who actually believes that there's a real case here? Come on. We all know the answer to this one. How about Alvin Bragg, right? 
the Manhattan district attorney. He felt that there is a what he that there's a legitimate case here to be brought. It went before a grand jury. They indicted. And now he's sitting just like anybody else. Yeah, Jonathan Turdley, right? Anybody else would have, look, I got charged with it. If I could be charged with it, and the Southern District of New York put in their papers, Lanny talks about it all the time on television, that they they um, call him individual number one. But if I could be, if I could be charged with it and you know, and end up doing uh prison time for it. Why is Donald any different than anybody else? Because if it was any one of our brigaders, I promise you, this case would have already been tried, decided, and you'd already be in orange somebody uh, somewhere, regardless of whether it was a jail or a prison. So you take it well, away. When yeah, Donald, you know, when Donald Trump's been attacking you, He's been saying things like, you know, and why isn't Cohen locked up in jail? Why didn't Cohen? And whenever he does that, I always say, I always think to myself, Cohen did go to prison. He was in Otisville. And then you locked him up in solitary confinement. Cohen, Cohen did his time and you were individual number one in, in the Cohen case, you know? And so anyway, let me show you what, uh, let me show you what Alina Habib just said on right wing media. This I believe was on Fox, but she's been saying this across right-wing media, comparing Donald Trump being admonished for intimidating a juror today to Nelson Mandela. Let's play this clip. Do you think that this threat of 30 days in jail will change the social media actions of the former president in any way, or will he keep doing this? I don't think so. I, I think that he is respectful, but there has to be boundaries and we should appeal it. It's currently on appeal. So there's also a due process element to this. We have the items on appeal in this case that have not yet been heard. Is so, he concerned about the possibility uh, we'll see, of being sent to jail as a ramification? No. of these? He's not concerned about being sent to jail. I... I don't I, I think uh, like anybody, he's concerned about going to jail. But if they put him in jail for his First Amendment right, he will be like Nelson Mandela. I mean, right. that would be just absurd. And frankly, they'll win um, him the Alina, election. I just have a second. Yeah, I mean, comparing him to Nelson Mandela there. Um, let me show you this next what one. Person, can, where... can, I, can I just jump in? Because, again, you're going to be the legal expert today, Ben. What's the First Amendment violation that he's talking about as a defendant? As a defendant, you cannot attempt to witness, intimidate, or obstruct justice. That's not – now, the judge turned around and said, if you, you want to talk about me, that's fine. But you can't talk about witnesses. You can't talk about his daughter. I mean, it's a very specific gag order. And gag orders are used all the time. I'm not so sure how they've extended this to First Amendment rights. You know what a First Amendment violation is? That two-page counterfeit document that they shoved in front of my face and demanded that I sign it or, that you know, what ultimately led to the unconstitutional retaliatory um, remand of me back to Otisville for another 16 days of solitary confinement because I wouldn't sign a counterfeit document that said that I couldn't speak, my family can't speak, friends can't speak, I can't publish a book, I can't do a movie, I can't do anything, right? That's called a violation of the First Amendment. I mean, Alina, look, God, God bless her, she's an idiot. You know, Donald Trump's arguments are always, whatever it is, I can do whatever I want. Right. Right. I have absolute presidential immunity. I can order SEAL Team Six to kill my political opponents. And if you are a former president or president, they let you do it. They let you get away with it. He, his view of the First Amendment is that basically somebody who robs a bank and says, give me all the money and then doesn't succeed in the bank robbery, that that's not a crime because the First Amendment, give me all of the money, as at least if it relates to Donald Trump, is protected by the First Amendment, when in fact, if you are engaged in speech in connection with and furtherance of a crime, there are, of course, limitations. Donald Trump's argument in the Mar-a-Lago document case is that if you are a president or former president, you can take any classified documents, you can take nuclear secrets, you can take war plans. And if you put it in a box and then you ship it to Mar-a-Lago, it then becomes your own personal property that the 
government's nuclear codes belong to him. And then what he tries to say is this was like when Bill Clinton was taking notes for his autobiography in 1999, and that allegedly Clinton had personal notes for the autobiography in a sock drawer. And so Trump's like, it's like the sock case. Me stealing the nuclear codes is like somebody taking personal notes for their personal autobiography. Mine, 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 mine. So these are the arguments he makes in every single context that the rules don't apply with him. And of course, the Access Hollywood tape, which is going to be discussed in this trial, Donald Trump said, when you're rich and famous and you're a rich and famous man, you can sexually assault women and they let you do it. That's Trump's war. And while the Access Hollywood tape itself can't come into this trial, it can be described and uh, discussed. I wanted to show this as well. This is Alina Haba. When she was asked about Don Snorleone, about Sleepy Don, Donald Trump continuing to fall asleep during the proceedings, here's what she said. Let's have a second, but you know, there's two reports both days of him falling asleep in, in court. Any reaction to that? Is he tired? Has he just been running around a lot or any thoughts on that? If anything, he's probably brutally bored. I mean, it's 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 painful. They make him sit there through jury selection. The first day was procedural. Uh, but no, you know, I've heard that report. It's unlikely. I know him. I sat through trial after trial with him. That never happens. Well, so that you have. Uh, President Trump is is incredibly focused. <laughs> All right. Alina, thank you, as always. Great to have you. here. You know, she always has that tell at the end where she goes, <laughs> you know, and she looks around whenever she's lying, which is basically all the time. Cohen, I want to remind all of the brigaders about patreon.com slash political beatdown. Um, we are going to, to the extent we can, we're pretty sure we're going to do it. Although, of course, there's a lot of developments that could change that. So on Thursday, you and I are going to try to uh, do a Zoom. And if we can't do a Zoom, we'll do an after show. So we'll try to do the Zoom at some point. And yeah, I think no, it let's worked. Do, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it on Thursday then. We, no, we, I thought it worked out really well, Cohen, when we did it after the Brother podcast as yes. well. So mm -hmm. maybe we do it right there and then we can cross post it on the Brothers Patreon and the Political sure. Beatdown Patreon. Sure. That worked out really well. It was a good time, I yeah. think, for everybody. Patreon.com slash Political Beatdown. Sign up now if you want to meet Michael Cohen this week on that Zoom chat. On Thursday, we'll do that uh, Zoom meeting for our patrons. Excited for that. Let's take our first and only quick ad break of the show. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? Look, I know about sleep quality because I'm sleep deprived. But if you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend that you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. It's inspired by NASA. Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so that you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Using silver-infused fabrics inspired by NASA, Miracle-Made sheets are thermoregulating and they're designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long so you get better sleep every night. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. I mean, no more gross odors. You see, Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands. And they feel as nice, if not nicer than sheets used by some five-star hotels. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Bacteria can clog your pores, causing breakouts and worse, acne. So sleep clean with Miracle. Go to trymiracle.com slash beat and try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo BEAT, that's B-E-A-T, at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, well, you'll get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash beat and use the code beat to claim your free 
three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash beat to treat yourself. And thank you, Miracle Maid, for sponsoring this episode. Welcome back to Political Beatdown right there. I was taking my little uh, break during the uh, ad. Just just made it in the nick of time. Michael Cohen, let's talk about um, Trump's sinking stock right now. Every day it seems to crash more and more. It's close to falling below $20 a share. There have been so many people who have uh, lost significant amounts of money on this. I've been... You and I and others on this network have been warning, look, we're not giving stock advice. I want to be very clear right. about that. I want to be clear right. that be very these clear are about opinions. that one. I want to be <laughs> very clear. We're not giving stock advice, and these are only you know our opinions. But for two years, when this SPAC was even announced, you know, I've been warning retail investors about this. Because if you look at the financials, the financials just don't math. They just don't make any sense, you know, for this company to have anywhere near the valuation that it did. A $58 million loss, um, a $4.1 million in revenue with like Devin Nunes, the former MAGA Republican Congress member, making almost like 15 to 20 percent of all of that, um, you know, in, in a salary. And then Cash Patel making a lot of money and Dan Scavino, who is Trump's deputy chief of staff, making a ton of money and was working with Trump now to this day. It, it just didn't make sense. The auditor. BF Borgers said that the uh, Trump media had substantial doubt about being able to continue as an ongoing concern. And that independent auditor also had a 21 out of 21 deficiency rating by the PCAOB. But even the deficient auditor, that's the entity that regulates auditors, still said that Trump media had substantial doubt about continuing. Trump sued the founder of the SPAC. The founder of the SPAC sued Trump. Trump sued the co-founders of Trump Media. The co-founders of Trump Media sued Donald Trump, saying that he was taking their 8.56% of the company. The founder of the Trump SPAC, Patrick Orlando, claims that another Trump Media director engaged in a corporate coup to oust him, actually use the word coup in a separate lawsuit. Two of the early investors at Trump Media, the Schwarzman brothers, pled guilty to insider trading and could be serving about 20 years for making over $22 million from insider trading. Trump Media was given a loan from something called Paxson Bank in an island of Dominica through a shady family trust that apparently has some links to Russia. And this Paxson Bank isn't, I think, licensed to do business in the U.S. That's why they had to create this family trust. But the Paxson Bank is known for loaning money or helping finance porn websites. And so that's what Trump Media is. And... And and this is what we're seeing the results, you know, the results here now. Ben, ben, do you remember when the stock first went IPO? And my God, for, first initially it was like a hundred and what seventy dollars a share uh, early, early on, and then when it went IPO, it was like at seventy eight or eighty dollars. It had that massive boom, and you and I started laughing here. On this show, as did so many of our brigaders. And again, we're not giving stock advice. I did turn around and say, I wish to God there was a way to short this shit because truth be told, I don't think you could even short it. I don't think they would take Everybody knew this stock was going down. So nobody was taking the orders anyway. Those people who bought, you got you got kind of stuck with the stock. And this is this is as been as has been described by experts. This is less than a $2 a share stock, if even that. Everybody's prediction early, early on that that I spoke to was that this is really a penny stock, that this is not a stock that should be on any you know legitimate platform. It's a penny stock. Uh, it's a meme stock. And they started going through the entire you know scenario onto it. It's exactly as we described what would happen. I actually thought it would it would be even less. Than the twenty-two dollars yesterday, it lost eighteen uh, percent. Uh, the week before that, it lost like thirty some odd percent in total. It's down like what is it, like seventy-five percent since its uh, opening? 
Well, let's just say you had a hundred million outstanding shares, give or take, and they've added additional shares, which diluted existing shareholders. Assume that each share was not valued at 22, assumed it was valued at $1 a share, right? That would mean the company is valued at basically as a market cap of what, $100 million, $1 a share, $100 million outstanding. Mm-hmm. If that's if that's the float, but the company lost fifty eight million dollars and only did four point one million revenue. So when you talk about the idea of a penny stock, so people know what that means. The question is, is that if a company is only earning four point one million in revenue for an entire year, and you had over one hundred million outstanding shares as your float, as it's called. What would each of those shares need to be equal to basically capture the valuation of something that's only doing 4.1 million in revenue while losing $58 million in revenue? So quite frankly, you would have to look at that and probably say it's it's in the pennies. It's something divisible from $1 because in my – again, this is just opinions, folks. $1 would seem to over – overvalue it just based on the simple math that I that I did right there. There's also another important deadline coming up that I don't think a lot of people are paying attention to, which is if the stock is kept above $17.50 for a 20-day out of 30-day period, Donald Trump gets what's called an earnout. Now, his shares will still be locked, so he can't actually sell the shares. But I think an additional 36 or 38 million shares will then be added on top of that. And if you see the math that I did before, so let's say there's 100 million and then you added another 38 million and then you added another 38 million shares. When people talk about dilution, you see why existing shareholders could then be diluted even further because what the market's trying to capture is okay what's the value of something that's only earning 4.1 million dollars a year and just by reference that's like the same amount of revenue that's earned by like a single solo McDonald's franchisee or a franchise you know a franchise McDonald's just just one store and so and and so and and not the whole company. So that's when we talk about the fundamentals here. And I'm somewhat oversimplifying. You, you know, it's funny though, Ben. Ben, because a lot of people, you know, in the chat are like, you know, why why should we care about this stock and so on? Because this stock and everything that Ben just described, it exemplifies who Donald Trump is and how he has run his life. Exactly. It ex- It is, it's an example of the way that he will run this country, which is identical to the disaster that he created in America when he was, when he was the president in 2016 to 2020, right? This is the problem. He doesn't understand the game. And what ultimately when this thing becomes completely worthless and maybe if he's the only one that ends up pulling some money out um you know and next thing maybe there'll be another a superseding charge that could come out of it who knows he'll blame it on everybody else in the world that's not what i do i just put my name to it it's the lawyers the accountants it's devin nunez I mean, that's what he's going to do. It's what he does all the time. It's like when Ben, you guys showed the video of him walking in. He's blaming the lawyers. He's blaming his accountants. He's blaming Alan Weisselberg, in essence, right? Um, Blaming me. He's blaming everybody except himself. This is a man who cannot accept responsibility for anything. You know, a lot of people were questioning, like, why would the SEC even approve this thing? And what's interesting about that, though, is I think Donald Trump may have been surprised that the SEC approved it. Perhaps Trump was just banking on that he could whine about it and say, the Biden SEC stopped this. This was going to make a hundred billion trillion dollars. I'm not sure. Did the SEC even have to approve this? Because the way I, as a SPAC, didn't they just do it as a reverse merger into a SPAC and then it automatically? Uh, it's. I mean, that's that's how it works when you you know reverse merger the. 
the company into the SPAC, you actually get the opportunity to avoid a lot of the SEC requirements. You avoid the SEC requirements that are as stringent as the initial public offering process, mm -hmm. but the S1 and the S2 documents have to all be signed off by the SEC. And so if the SEC yeah. finds that the forms are inadequate, and really what the SEC is looking at, though, is not necessarily financial viability of the company. That's not what the SEC is looking at. What they're looking at are, are all of the disclosures that have to be made. Are they made? And if you actually look at the disclosures for the reverse merger documents that you discussed, there's a whole section that lists all of Donald Trump's bankruptcies. And it's like, this was bankrupt, that was bankrupt, this was bankrupt. And they have to disclose that to the shareholders. Then they go over all of Trump's businesses from Trump airplanes to Trump stakes to Trump University. It's like a dozen things about it, you know, maybe more. And then they did the bankruptcies before that. And it's a list of everything he's touched, most of the things he's touched on. Failure, failure, bankrupt, bankrupt, failure, failure, bankrupt, bankrupt. And the SEC's job is a disclosure. Did you appropriately mm -hmm. make those disclosures? So they made the disclosure. So the SEC signed off on it. But the SEC was holding it up because the uh, there were two prior account or at least one prior accounting firm that quit and resigned and said, you can't trust our financials, basically. So then Trump got this BF Borgers guy who has the high deficiency rate, whose office in Colorado looks like a rest stop bathroom off of the highway. And, and Borgers was the one who basically signed off on it. But even in Borgers sign off, Borger says that Trump media can't exist as a um, ongoing concern. But look, President Biden, who's now leading in the polls, despite what Donald Trump says, President Biden's going on the offense and having some fun with it as well. Here's President Biden, though, talking about Trump's stock tanking. Let's play this clip if we got it. You know, I have to say, if Trump's stock and the true social, his, his company, drops me lower, he might do better under my tax plan than his. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, I thought, that, I thought that was a good line right there. Let, let me just share with you some of the um, you know headlines right here. So in terms of the average national presidential polling lead, and I hate talking about polls, but the right wing tries to flood the zone with such false data on polls that I think it is. I hate talking about polls, but we have to just rebut it with the data every time Donald Trump says, I'm ahead of the polls. You're not. The national averages have President Biden up by about 1.2 percent, but I don't want to dwell and focus on polls. Let's talk about headlines, though. As Carl Quintanilla from CNBC explains, this week so far, U.S. to grow at double the rate of G7 peers this year, says the IMF. The number of homicides plummets in major U.S. cities. Envy of the world, U.S. economy expected to keep powering higher. Economists lift their growth forecast in latest Wall Street Journal survey. And you would think the way right-wing media and media in general you know, is talking about the current moment. Cohen, you would think that we were in like 2008 during the Great Recession. And, you know, these headlines that I'm but, sharing. But here's the problem, though. They're d Democrats, and I've been a Democrat most of my entire life, they're terrible at messaging. These are incredible statistics, right? One thing people have to understand, and, and, and too many people don't truly understand that the world is a global market. America is part of that global market. And so what happens in China affects America. What happens in Russia affects what happens in Saudi Arabia, affects the United States market. Each what happens in Canada affects the United States market, whether it's aluminum, whether it's wood and in uh, Russia, it could it's also oil and natural resources. I mean, you know, Taiwan, you have the chips, uh, you know, the, the material for the for the um, microchips. I mean, everything we are a global economy and 
you know, not there's no country that produces everything. And so when there's issues on the opposite side of the pond or the other side of the world, it affects our market. Somehow, somehow Biden, despite all of the global nonsense and shit that's going on right now, somehow or another, we have managed as the United States of America, under Biden's administration, we have managed to grow the country by significant numbers greater than any other than any of our you know competing countries i mean it's uh, the the rate of the g7 peers we we're doubling them it's in, it's incredible and instead of taking a victory lap which biden should take a victory lap put out an ad about it where as a country, we're kicking ass. So generally, what does that mean? That means that foreign countries, foreign investors will want to invest in the United States because they're always seeking a place to put their money where there is growth potential, right? So there's going to be investments into America. Hopefully, the investment will be manufacturing, which will create mid-level jobs, et cetera, et cetera. This is not rocket science. The problem, though, most people don't know this. And Biden is doing a great job, but he's doing a great job that only a handful of people like our brigaders know. And the goal is to make sure that everyone in America knows how good he's doing. President Biden speaking in Scranton, Pennsylvania today to a crowd erupting into chants of four more years. Let's play this clip from earlier. We are the United States of America. There is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity of when we act together. God bless you all. May God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you. It's a powerful moment right there. Cohen, I have to give you an assist right now to get that two-finger salute, and I'll steer it in this area where I feel you can comfortably give a two-finger comfortably give a two-finger salute. I want to show you this from uh, earlier in the day. First, this is in the House of Representatives where um, MAGA Republican Congress member Massey talks about how he has demanded that MAGA Mike Johnson, the speaker, resign. So the MAGA Republicans are in utter chaos. First, let me show you this, and then I'm going to show you a clip of Marjorie Taylor Greene, and I think I'm going to get you, I think I'm going to give you the assist. Yeah, first, I, think, I, think, I think you're giving me a layup here, pal. First, Massey, though. Play this clip. There's only one person right now who can stop us from going into what happened last fall, and that's Mike Johnson. He's cleaning the barn. That's obvious. So you want him to resign? You want him to resign? Yes. Yeah, I asked him to resign. What did he say? What did he, say? he said he would not. And then I said, well, you're the one who's going to put us into this. Because the motion is going to get called, okay? Does anybody doubt that? The motion will get called. And then he's going to lose more votes than Kevin McCarthy. And I have told him this in private, like, weeks ago. Total MAGA Republican chaos there. And then at a committee yeah. hearing today, yeah. Marjorie Tan Ta yeah, and before you go, on, Thomas Thomas Massey to me looks exactly why cousins or relatives should never marry. Marjorie Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene during a committee hearing. You know the MAGA Republicans have been using uh, the uh, death, the murder of Lake and Riley as a way to um, you know to to really politicize it. Um, but Marjorie Taylor Greene and the MAGA Republicans keep screwing it up like, you know, they wanted to like uh, be like, well, President Biden didn't know how to say her name right. They said it was Lincoln Riley. Then you have all of these clips of like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Donald Trump saying Lincoln Riley, Lincoln Riley, Lincoln Riley. And here during a committee hearing, Marjorie Taylor Greene called for the deportation of Lincoln Riley 
during uh, a committee hearing where the Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas was present here. Watch, watch this. Like Lakin Riley, you're familiar with her, right? Congressman, our heart breaks. Are you familiar with Lakin Riley? Uh, uh, I am uh, familiar with the case. And you should have deported her so that she could be alive today. Her parents would have appreciated that. Cohen. Yeah, um, great layup for me on that. You know, I'd like to sort of separate the two fingers salute. One of them has to go to the first former president ever in the history of this country who's right now sitting at the defendant's table for basically doing and behaving in a manner that is so undignified to this country, he's got to get one. But equally, equally to him has to be this Marjorie Toilet Green and all of these fucking losers that are just following, following in that far right wing ecosystem sphere that's just messing up the country. It's like now you're going to have Mike Johnson is going to get knocked out because there's only he only they only need one vote. Only one vote separates it, and he'll be out. So what happens to Congress? They're, they're completely shut down until they ultimately find another. I'll tell you what I would do. You ready for this one, Ben? Brigaders, ready? Yeah. If I was the Democrats over there, I would turn around and say to Mike Johnson, tell you what you do, pal. Switch parties. Switch parties. And we will support you, and we will then have the plus one vote because it's all that separates them. Now you're a Democrat. We now control the House. We control the Senate. And we control the White House. And so that's how you get shit done. Instead of MAGA Mike Johnson sitting there thinking that with Donald Trump's help, that it's going to placate the Marjorie Toilet Greens, this Massey, and the rest of you. I don't know if you saw them all walking down in order to, uh, with Mayorkas, in order to file the articles of impeachment. It is a disgrace, a bunch of fucking morons. There's no other way to describe them. So to Donald, here you go. To Massey and Marjorie Toilet Green and the rest of you, here you go. All right? Take it and do with it as you wish. There you have it, folks. Michael Cohen, appreciate it. So I want to remind everybody to sign up for patreon.com slash political beatdown. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash political beatdown. On Thursday, we're going to do that after the Brother podcast, after the Brother live show. So that's 9.30 Eastern, 6.30 Pacific for a half hour. Hang out with Michael Cohen on this exclusive Zoom. If you ever wanted to meet Michael Cohen, that's a perfect time uh, to do that. Um, you know, we'll try to we'll try to keep it light again. The last time we did it was actually a it was a ton of fun when we did it last week. We kept the topics light. Um, really appreciate you, Cohen. I know how busy things are for you right now. The it's, fact it's that you're not spending. just that it's busy, Ben. I got to say this to the brigaders too, since you you know it because it's really um, thanks to you that I'm even able to. It's this is. It's, I, I can't believe this. I was having this conversation with my mom not, not, uh, not too many hours ago. And she's like, why, why is this taking such a toll on you, right? You're not the defendant here. You're just a non-party subpoenaed witness. I mean, I don't know if you can tell. Ben, <laughs> I'm legitimately down 25 pounds. Yeah, I can it's tell you. Very it's very hard for me. It's really hard for me. To, to even eat. It's like I'm I'm so wound up over this uh this you know this upcoming trial and not because I'm fearful for going and testifying. I want to remind the brigaders and everybody I testified before the Mueller report. I testified before seven congressional committees. I've already been before the New York Attorney General and the gen and the uh and the grand jury. I've already been before the Manhattan DA. Now it's just one more, one more to go. And so I don't know what it is about this whole thing. You know, maybe some of it has to do with, you know, even reminiscing about, you know, the past. Um, and, you know, this whole thing just triggers for me uh, a whole series of emotions 
because of the way that the Department of Justice mistreated me. So it's just, I'm overwhelmed by it. And maybe I'm also a little obsessive compulsive. I've been told that, you know, several times in my life, I, I'm a little OCD, uh, maybe a little more than most, whatever it is, you know, it's, it's, it's weighing heavy on me, on my heart, on my, my mind, my soul, my blood pressure is through the roof, right? But it's really the brigaders. It's you guys, and you know, and my my supporters over at Maya Culpa that you keep me, you keep me going, you keep me breathing, you know, and you just keep me moving forward. It's so hard. I can't even explain it. I don't know if you've ever had anything in your life that feels like there's a wall in front of you, and you just wanna, you just wanna get on an airplane and leave. You just want to you want to go somewhere where nobody knows your name, where you just get to live your life. I can live my life with my wife. We're going on a 30 year. And I say 30 year, Ben, because you're just getting married. Whereas in 30 years, brother. All right. You know, and, you know, just be able to take my my kids and try to recreate a life of what I used to have, you know, instead of how much was taken, you know, from me. Not just not just emotionally and physically, but financially and everything. So, you know, I want to personally just thank all our Patreon members. I want to thank all our brigaders. And I want to thank you, Ben, and the brothers, because this outlet is um, it's a source of my able my ability to just keep going. It's very it's very tough. Well, we're all here for you, uh, Michael Cohen. We're all uh, grateful for you, Michael Cohen. Um, I want to remind everybody as well that um, y y there are a lot of people who think they're subscribed to the Midas Touch YouTube channel, but didn't actually hit the subscribe button um, because you check so frequently with the updates and it's so on your algorithm. But just hit the subscribe button right now if you're not subscribed. Also, make sure you subscribe to the Maya Culpa Blue, not the red. That's Michael Cohen's other podcast. That's what it looks like. It's blue, not red. Michael Cohen, mea culpa, nothing but the truth, a Midas Touch Network uh, podcast. And uh, we're going to do something a little interesting here. If you all just stay in this room, we're going to, uh, this is going to be transferred over to, you know, Don Lemon started a YouTube channel and he's been featuring all the Midas Touch people on that channel. He's had Dina on and um, he's at Karen Friedman Agnifilo and Mockler and, and the whole crew. And so he's doing his thing there. And we've been supportive of his growth as he's also supporting the Midas Mighty. So it'll send you all there as well. But Michael Cohen, thank you for everything. We appreciate you. Shout out to the Beatdown Brigaders and shout out to the Midas Mighty. Have a good one.